by Danny. Right behind us. Did you see that? Yes! Oh my god! I just about died! Oh, I went all fucking up after this guy! Do, do, do you feel like grunge is an empty word? I mean, there's nothing to yes. it? Yes. Yeah, it's an empty word. Nothing to it. Nothing to it. Nothing to grunge. Nothing to grunge. One might say that Tad was the pioneer of this inventor of, of this. In some ways, they're the quintessential grunge band. When she woke up, she had a chainsaw. Put it through the woods and the field. They were the combination of musical ingenuity, musical fluidity, a sense of humor, a sense of style. But I mean, they really were as charismatic a band as any that were ever on Sub Pop. Like Tad the band, they kind of took on this character. Like there's Tad the person, and then there's T-A-D, capital letters, Tad. Hello, people. My name is Gary, and I play washboard. My name is Kurt. I play bass. I'm Tad, I play with myself. All the musicians were really skilled, had quite sophisticated approach to their instruments. At one point, they were the favored horse coming out of Seattle. Without Tad, to me, there'd be like a black hole or a gap. It's like, well, where was like that really intense? The rawest of the raw. They were the heaviest and the meanest and the darkest sounding band of the scene, and I think that influenced a lot of people. <laughs> I think of the Tad band, I think of smoking pot. Smoke pot! Smoke pot! Dude, like, fuck if their dressing room wasn't a smoky haze. I think of bombs. It's a real miracle band, a garage band that never grew up. It wasn't just because they were weird looking, it was also because they were a good band. That's a cut there. Let's, let's take it back to the beginning. Action. Uh, it was late 88, early 89. Um, and there was this, this regional sound in the air. And we, we felt like we were, we were, we were part of, uh, of, of the select group of people that were allowed to document it. There wasn't a lot of, you know, national acts coming through or like a lot of good indie acts coming through as much as later years. So it was kind of like an isolated area where these people were coming up with music and uh, they're mostly influencing each other. Not being too self-conscious about what they were doing. That was the best thing about it was bands wanted to just, they had a very clear artistic vision and that's what they wanted to pursue. It wasn't like trying to think of what would get them signed or what would get them attention or what the fans would like. It was more about what, you know, people were very much doing the music that they wanted to be doing, making the records that they wanted to make. Commercial considerations hadn't really come into the picture yet. There wasn't any inkling of any kind of idea like, I'm going to get rich and famous from doing this. There was no concept of it being a career. It was just like, here and now in the moment this is what we're doing i don't care if it's gonna fall apart tomorrow i don't remember yesterday this is what we're doing now yeah it was great i, I just remember it being vibrant exciting and incredibly supportive and collaborative everyone all these bands are checking out everyone else's shows and their tapes it didn't seem like there were any kind of like petty rivalries or animosities People would come together and, and it was a, a positive, supportive 
situation, scene. That made things a lot of fun. All of a sudden, you'd go to a, you know, a Tad show, and there would be hundreds of people there, and hardly anyone that I knew. Fuck, man. The sense of family, or at least like familiarity, was gone. The whole grunge scene was really just an extension of rock and roll hype that has been going on since, you know, the Colonel and Elvis Presley and even before that. Into one, one word grunge, it's like all new wave bands sound alike or all rock bands sound alike. Like and then uh, one day the devil came and said, uh, you know, well, pay you guys more money to play uh, Satan rock. So we began to play sat satanic rock music and, uh, uh, you know, it's something we do, but it's not like, uh, yeah, we don't take it home with us. We just leave it at the office. Yes, you wanted the best, and you got it! The hottest man in the land! Time! It was just one word that, that kind of summed it all up, and that's heavy. We're here to destroy your hearing. Yeah, Tad was the biggest thing I ever heard, and in, in my life because, you know, I'm, I'm from Fayetteville, Arkansas originally, you know, when I, you know, Black Sabbath, Leonard Skinner and Black Sabbath, you know, there was, there was nothing, nothing, you know, remotely heavy. It was just always, you know, like garage band here, garage band, punk rock band here, punk rock band, hardcore band. None of it was even close to the first time that I actually got to see those guys play Behemoth. That was like the, I was like, well, you know, clearly this is what you want to be hearing. And I, and I was convinced that Tad was the best band out of all the bands I was getting to see at the off-ramp. Tad was just pretty much balls to the wall kind of angst. I remember seeing Tad at a show at one of the clubs in Pioneer Square, and the sound was literally so heavy that I, I felt like I was having a heart attack or something. Um, because I, it, 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 you know, made your chest cavity actually beat. Tad is so loud, and just so heavy. We would play so loud that I would like almost pass out. You see a guy that big moving around that much, and there's skinny ass little 18 year olds that cannot rock that hard. Not only that, but you put in between it the onstage banter. I mean, the guy is quick. You know, so it's like almost seeing you get badass rock and stand-up comedy all in one. I'm extremely fat and overweight, and you're not. Fine, I'm pissed off. God damn it. Hey, I'm told you're supposed to take care of my microphone needs tonight. They're all fucked up. But I mean it, really, I do. You guys don't know me. I really mean fuck you. All of you. Fuck you. You know, you had Kurt Danielson who, like, would headbang through the entire set to see somebody who would do that with such intensity. I mean, you kind of thought that he was, he may be having some kind of seizure. Tad was this big guy dwarfing his guitar and have this huge guy jumping out and into a crowd and the crowd like, ah! Middle of the show, he, uh, he stage dived and crushed a few people. <laughs> it was uh, something that people are probably telling their children at this moment and the legend will be passed on to their children and so forth. Uh, I just remember once in Portland when Tad just fucking ran backwards and he ran into his guitar stack and the whole thing just went flying. And he went kind of flying too. And that just freaked me out, man. And just to see Tad like wailing around and his guitar's like, un, you know, like not strapped and he's still wailing and jumping the crowd or something. 
if you listen to Tad and you didn't have a visual image for them, you would think these are, you know, this is the Seattle version of Sonic Youth in some ways. These are sophisticated hipsters creating this very deep and sophisticated sound. It was like, well, this is great. And this is what Tad's doing. This is great. It's like, he's totally, you know, like pushing the envelope. This is, you know, about as anti-radio rock as you're going to get, which it was like, it was cool because that's where we're all like, oh, this is, you know, I want to be anti-radio rock. I want to do this stuff. gotten a tax return from uh, 1986. I took my whole tax return in. I come from being a drummer in a band. That was my main instrument. And I, I bought a guitar and wanted to play guitar. And I had this little champ amp, which is right there. Um, and I played that and came up with these ideas. And, uh, and I, I just wanted to try it out and see how it would sound and went into a, a studio called Reciprocal with uh, Jack and Dino. There was no click tracks. He did the drum track and then he came in and overdubbed the guitar, overdubbed some bass and then did the vocals and that became his first seven inch on the Sub Pop label. I remember taking it to work that the next day, a cassette of it. I worked with Tad uh, at Muzak in uh, 87 until the uh, spring of 88. I was working in the cartridge cleaning room. That's my first job there. And I was working with Mark Arm. It was a totally loud room and we'd be cranking like, you know, the butthole surfers or scratch acid or the first dinosaur record, you know. And I remember one day like, Tad came in with this, these songs that he'd recorded. Bruce Pavitt came in and he had this crazy look on his face, like, you know, what's this, you know? And then he like walked out of the room like his mind was blown and then he came back a little later and he said, we'd start talking about, you know, I said, man, I'd, maybe uh, we can put something out. And he goes, yeah, I'd love to put it on a single. Bruce was blown away and he played it for me. I thought it was fucking amazing. Here's the one interesting thing. Every band had established itself as a, as a live or perf performing artist, in many cases, years before they recorded. Tad was a recording artist. Years before there was a band Tad, there was the guy Tad. The response to that single was so good that he said, well, you know, maybe I should actually get another drummer and get a bass player and get a guitarist and, and have a band. Tad told me that he was uh, recording a, a single uh, with Jack and Dino uh, at Reciprocal and uh, did I want to come down and check out what he was working on and I was like yeah yeah I was like really blown away with what Tad was doing all by himself I mean he was playing all the instruments writing all the stuff and it was really impressive in the band I was in Bundle of Hiss used to play gigs with with H Hour which is a band that Tad used to play drums for and uh, that's when Tad and I met I didn't realize it at the time, but, but Tad was planning on switching to guitar and quitting the drums. And H. Hour broke up uh, over that issue and, and others perhaps. Kurt and I got along really well and we shared similar humor. And uh, so that's kind of how it started there. And, and I, I had always been a fan of a drummer who was playing in a band called Death and Taxes at the time, and that wound up being Steve Weed. Our keyboard had just moved to. California and uh, we were like wow what do we do now so Tad you know he talked to Sub Pop and he got a single out and stuff so I was like okay that sounds cool let's do it you know so and uh, Kurt knew about a guy that was playing guitar Gary had been uh, in a band with Jonathan Ponham and, and so I called up John and I, I had seen Gary play with John before in, in a band they had a band together called the Tree Climbers and I was just blown away by his guitar playing. So we asked Gary to come in. And I said, well, why don't we just get these two guys together and we'll start seeing how it works. And uh, 
That's what became the first incarnation of Tad. When the band got together, for example, we encouraged them just to call the band Tad versus any other name because uh, Tad had such a pronounced personality and such a presence that we, f we felt that the media would warm up to Tad. How do you feel about what happened to Seattle? What happened to it? The hype. Oh, I thought you meant it blew up or something. Earthquake, oh my God. Uh, the hype? Well, it, it's just that, nothing but hype. Seattle was, was a nice, friendly little college town. Uh, you know, a maritime city, a port city, right on the water, very nice. Rains a little bit too much, but uh, there are a few rock bands, uh, just like in any other city, but then there was a record label, Sub Pop. Bruce and I went into business on a full-time basis over at 1932 First Avenue, which is where our first office was on April 1st, 1988, April Fool's Day. So we've always used that as being kind of the beginning of the company. We felt there was a certain vibe going on in the city. All these groups were playing a kind of a sludgier, grungier, punk metal sound uh, that was super powerful. Here comes sickness, moving up my block. Oh, she come to my house? I hope she don't. So as a label, we were trying to capture the essence of that scene. We weren't sh sure how long that sound was going to last or where it was going to go, but we wanted to document it because we thought there was there was a, a definite scene there and a sound. They knew what they wanted. They had uh, a concept for the label, both visually, uh, in terms of live photographs and graphics and sonically with, with, with a kind of regional sound. They, they felt it and saw it developing as well and they wanted to document it. And it was like recognizing a chemical reaction occurring. Keep in mind, these are two guys that, you know, went to uh, community colleges and one of them, you know, his degree was basically smoking pot and spinning records, you know. All of a sudden, they're passion and their, where their heart lies is becoming a business. In our own modest way, we were trying to recreate something that it would stimulate people's imagination. Because there are hundreds of thousands of bands out there, and there always are millions of bands, and the way that you're going to make a distinction is by, of course, first and foremost, making music that people care about, but they also want to care about the people who are making the music. And that, you know, you create a, uh, a mythology. If you just say, hey, you know, we're a rock band from Seattle and we practice a lot in our garage and we have, you know, we work at Kinko's and, you know, we hate our day jobs and we want to be rock stars, it's like, <laughs> you know, fuck that, man. You know, you and everybody else, you know, but you want to, like, create this whole sense that, you know, this is, we're an invading horde and, you know, we live on mountains and we eat raw flesh and we're going to come and rape your children. They played the role to a T. We're from Seattle, Washington. We, we, we play rock and roll. Punk rock, rock and roll. Don't be shy. Don't piss me off. And whatever you do, stand back because we're going to blow your fucking nuts off if you got any. Not only did you have an incredibly heavy sound, but Tad was kind of an icon of heaviness and uh, visually lent uh, another level of intensity to the music. Just this giant dude with a full beard, reflecto shades, some kind of crazy trucker hat, an Ed Gein t-shirt, and he looked like somebody, you know, he looked like a, he looked like a trucker or like some 
kind of scary serial killer. And, you know, Kurt Danielson looked exactly the same, you know, like j just as scary. He looked like some kind of crazy redneck lumberjack or something. And they just looked dangerous and there was nothing cute about them. They were really, really scary looking band. I hope I didn't offend any of you college yuppie types. The kind that your mother says your turn up turns into a casserole at midnight. Your chariot sure turns into a pumpkin at one. And you better not go home and Bill, or I'm gonna spank your butt. In reality, you know, he was so different from the character that was being concocted. I mean, I, I, re I remember going out, uh, taking some pictures on the set of their uh, Wood Goblins video. And I had to show Tad how to like, you know, start up the, the chainsaw. We all knew that that's not really Tad, who Tad is. But of course, you know, the label and the band to a degree, you know, wanted to play that up. I think the guys in Sub Pop thought this was cute. It pissed me off. And all the interviews we did for that year or afterwards, I would always make a point, the band Soundgarden make a point of saying, this guy is like brilliant and he's like smart as hell and the whole fucking band is smart as hell. But the initial mark, I think the initial single had like on the label, Tad scrawling, you know, with like backward letters. Hi, my name is Tad. Trying to market this sort of, uh, you know, folky, savant sort of character. You know, kind of retarded, huge monster of a man who somehow makes his beautiful music. People give too much emphasis on the personal story, which is important with folk artists and, and in popular culture. But ultimately, you know, who, does the work stand on its own? Is it beautiful? We definitely wanted to be exploited. There was no question about it. Um, and there, we didn't have many scruples about how it was done, uh, so long as it succeeded. Later, perhaps, we had some regrets that, that we were boxed into this, this grunge category. And not only that, that we were always being referred to as this band that was headed by a 300-pound ex-butcher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we felt like uh, that people came to see us for those reasons instead of the fact that we had songs that were worth listening to. I think a lot of the bands, you know, Nirvana, and to a lesser degree, Tad sort of resented it. It's hype, you know, and that hype, I, I've got to say, helped propel all of the bands. I don't, it's by no means solely responsible. I think as the years went by, he came to appreciate, you know, that there's a certain artistry in, in the creation of the mythology. This is hate number 17 is where he appeared. And, um, at the time, the TV show The Simpsons started having a lot of celebrity guest stars. So I thought it'd be funny, since I just did this lowly, cruddy comic book, to do the same, to have a celebrity guest star. So I, I um, wrote Tad into this one story. And uh, the idea behind it was um, the main character in the comic, uh, in, in, in hey, Buddy Bradley, he had this friend named Stinky. And Stinky's the type of guy that even though the average person never heard of Ted, you know, to Stinky, that would be like meeting a god. You know, it's like, oh my god, it's, it's Tad, I can't believe it. And the other thing that was very funny is because Tad had, used to have this reputation of being a wild guy or a party animal, a lot of people, like younger people, would always say, I want to party with Tad. That'd be a phrase that I used to hear a lot. Or like people would always ask me, did you party with Tad? I hear it's awesome to party with Tad. I want to party with Tad. And uh, so I thought it'd be funny to have this character Stinky meet him and say, we're going to party with Dad. <laughs> so that's how that came about. And of course, as soon as the comic came out, uh, more people than not said, who the hell is Dad? <laughs> it's Dad. And it's totally heavy. Tad, available at awesome record stores near you on Sub Pop. The uh, first official Tad release on Sub Pop was the, uh, <laughs> the 
the album called God's Balls. And we thought it was, you know, cocky enough too, and, you know, somewhat shocking. The band really had like a great sense of humor. I remember um, Ted coming in and going, this is the heaviest album title we could come up with was God's Balls. <laughs> it was just... Kurt Danielson had a porno video that he saw, and it was uh, some priest getting a blowjob from a nun. He would scream, God's balls! God's balls, that feels good. God's balls, that feels good! And I thought, God, that's a great line. And uh, so I kept it in mind, and when we were in the studio recording, I, I, I just mentioned it to, to Indino. I said, that's the title. You have to use that title. We'd make jokes about that, and we always were making jokes about porno movies, so... That's where the title came from. I know that the SGM really liked it. That was a Seattle gay newspaper. They really liked it. I believe that John was, was there uh, for this particular session, and I remember seeing him in the control room banging his head. So I was really pleased to see a friend getting into the music. Kurt had really good lyrics, and uh, we had good ideas that we just like, we wanted to hammer uh, just a riff, you know, and uh, have, a, have a groove to it too. That was our main thing. I think that's really what set us apart from a lot of bands. The rest of the sub pop crowd was was all about the keep it simple, keep it basic, keep it rocking sort of thing. And, and Tad's thing was always to try and go a little further. You know, let's play around with melody, experiment with arrangements, and still keep it brutal. Kurt and I, when we started playing together, we decided that we wanted to we wanted to be as l low and, and and nasty. We were going for the brown note, you know. And we used to make jokes about that, you know, like, what happened to your concert last night? Well, three people shit their pants. And here we were uh, working together as a band uh, after meeting only two weeks before and having only practiced a few times, and boom, the, the stuff just came out. Bruce Pavitt just really wanted to, to feature Tad and you know his sort of uh, almost like a mugshot kind of thing and uh, really play up the personality of, of this individual. I remember my mom when I showed her the record when she was still alive she goes she saw the picture and she saw me smiling and she goes oh you look so good and then she saw the title and she says oh Tad how could you why why did you name the record that? And it was disappointing for him, but then she'd go back and like, well, you're smiling, that looks good, that's nice. Nice boy. Uh, this is Tad. There was always a, a really great crowd reaction at Tad gigs. I think Tad was really the really good at, at working up the audience. Actually, some of the best photos I got were of Kurt, the bass player. And he's actually featured in my book, Touch Band 6. There's a double page spread, one where he's smoking out of a bong, and then the other where later that evening he's, he's on stage. He had an amazing presence, you know, as far as being a bass player goes. I know that Tad and Kurt were kind of always the core of the band and those guys seemed closer than anybody else. He's funny as shit and very well read, highly educated and a uh, great songwriter. He was uh, getting an English degree and uh, he was very focused on becoming a poet. So, you know, he used to kind of hang out at this, uh, this is kind of before espresso blew up really huge. This coffee shop called the Allegro, drinking espresso, hanging out with a bunch, a bunch of beatnik types. You know, he'd wore like a beret on occasion. Like Kurt Danielson went from this guy who was like 
sip an espresso, going to poetry readings, uh, you know, very nice, very nice. Wearing a beret to uh, this guy who made this t-shirt hand scrawled in giant letters, Stinky Pussy Stinks. Stinky Pussy Stinks on it. And it's like, dude, you are as politically incorrect as any human being I have ever met. It was like he just tossed his uh, Baudelaire and Rilke books out the window and said, fuck it. <laughs> if somebody in 1989 said, yeah, I know Kurt, I'm buddies with Kurt, it was Kurt Danielson, not Kurt Cobain. Are you ready? Kurt Danielson was a very popular musician a friendly guy, had been in a number of bands, a very talented musician, had a great amount of respect. And when people said, Kurt's got a new band, they were talking about Danielson and not Cobain. That was the best and most effective sonic representation of the way that the Tad Band sound, actually sounded live. And uh, I think Steve Albini just completely understood the band. We were tired when we came back. We put a lot into it. We poured ourselves into it. And, you know, we did this EP, you know, like eight, seven songs in three days, recording and mixing. It was, it was like the recording of an accident, of a car accident. Nothing rehearsed. It was just a collision, and it was on tape. When we got, you know, the rough mixes of that, I, this is back in the, age of cassette tapes. I, I wore that tape down in like two weeks. I listened to it over and over and over and over. Well, the name of my Kurt Cobain biography, Heavier Than Heaven, comes from a line that I liked that I discovered uh, was what English journalists had nicknamed the tour of Tad and Nirvana that went through England early in their careers. They called it the Heavier Than Heaven tour. And that name came both from the fact that the sound of the bands was very, very heavy it came from Tad's girth. This was a heavy band. And it also came from the sort of ethereal sound that, that some of, I think, Kurt Cobain's songwriting was already starting to approach. That tour with Tad was the tour. You know, these were the neutron bomb bands of, of Seattle. <laughs> It was good because we'd seen these guys play and they, they became good friends here on stateside and then we're going over to Europe together on a co-headlining tour. As a band, you get to know your fellow band members and if you go out with, with another band, then you get to know them just as if they were in your band too, especially since we were sharing the same van. Both bands were in this Euro van and they have the tall, you know, luggage area. We had all our t-shirts, all our gear, all of us plus our sound man, plus our driver, all crammed in the same Fiat van, the same standard Fiat van everybody tours in. You know, I'm a big guy, and uh, Nova Selich is a tall guy, and I remember seeing him all hunched up like in, in a seat like this, wherever, because they're small seats, you know? So we were all just crammed in this van. There wasn't really any room to even move. The stories that people told me, it was literally like the joking, they say, a Chinese fire drill. If somebody had to go to the bathroom, they had to unpack all the, the gear. Maybe I might have had the best luck being the smallest of everybody there. It was, it, was, it was quite an experience. It was a lot of work. We were young and naive, and we didn't care. that We, we wanted to work our asses off. We, we wanted 
to sacrifice ourselves for the music we believed in, and this was a chance to do it. And I remember playing in the UK with uh, Nirvana, and it's just just complete mayhem. Kids dropping down from the, the rafters one after the other, just floating off the stages, just like constantly. Just didn't know what to make of it at the time. Like, wow, this is pretty bizarre. <laughs> Because we have hindsight, you know, Nirvana went and became huge. Everyone thinks that that tour and many of those early shows that all anyone talked about was Nirvana, and that's not true at all. Tad got just as much ink and attention as Nirvana did, you know, on that, that tour. They were truly co-headliners. It wasn't that Nirvana was even bigger than Tad. There was one person that you could pull out and go, okay, we wanted to do a photo shoot with this guy because he embodies this kind of Northwest Americana. I think the British audience was getting really fed up with the, the lightness of a lot of the indie British pop that was coming out. What was really fun is, you know, we were switching off night after night. There, you know, one night Tad would headline, then, and then the next night we would, and then they'd just go back and forth. I remember it took Nirvana, it took us a, a, about a week or so, a couple weeks into the tour to finally kind of find our groove and start playing well. Like, just making the transition, it took a while like, to, get up, to get up to speed, but then we started playing well. And see, we would open for Tad in the UK because Tad were in the music newspapers, and so we were like the opening act. And We had lots of great conversations. We became, we, we became brothers. I remember, you know, uh, Kurt telling me the stories of that tour, and, and he lit up like, you never saw him lit up. He described so wonderfully when Tad also was vomiting a lot, and, and Cobain became just fascinated with it. Kurt would always light up during that time, He'd like get up from laying down, you know, laying down backstage and just hold the bucket for me and laugh. He enjoyed them more than anybody else did, and certainly I think more than Tad did. <laughs> We'd rate it, you know, like how was that one? Well, I'd say, you know, on chunk wise, it was a seven. And, and he says, you, you're, you got tears coming out of your eyes. I'd say that's a good one for velocity. And Kurt had a great amount of respect for Tad and for everybody in that band. Tad, as I write in Heavier Than Heaven, in some ways became Kurt's muse for a couple of months. He wrote, you know, a couple of songs about Tad, or at least about the weird bodily fluids. They rejected uh, Wood Goblins because, according to them, it was too ugly. <laughs> Which was, we, we kind of thought, kind of cool. <laughs> Being too ugly for MTV during the era of uh, Cherry Pie and, and Skid Row and shit like that. Uh, uh, I don't know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> They aired a later video claiming, claiming that, that uh, they had been uh, criticized for not airing Tad videos. But that's not true, because we're going to air one right now. And then they aired a later one that was not nearly as heavy or as ugly. And my boss was like, yeah, Tad. Tad ripped out the urinal out of the wall, damn it. And I was like, somebody ripped a urinal out of a wall? And I was like, Tad? Who's Tad? Does he work here? He's the rock lord and master. He really is. Everybody respects him as a musician. He's a, a musical genius. Um, 
he studied classical percussion and mastered uh, musical theory so that when uh, it came to playing rock drums, it was like stealing candy from a baby. People who are fans of the band and don't know him at all, they'd be might be surprised to know that he is hardly the scary, insane guy that he portrays himself to be. And he's like one of the sweetest, funniest, kindest people I've ever met. When I finally got to meet him, he, he said something like, um, hi, my name is uh, Thomas Doyle, nice to meet you. And he was like the nicest dude I ever met in my life. I couldn't imagine that he was the urinal destroyer, you know, that I heard about. Well, when Ted comes at you and speaks to you for the first time, uh, and you don't know what to expect, if he's angry, he really tells you what's on his mind. But uh, the big thing about Ted is he's a huggy bear. He's a real pussycat. And if you get to know Ted, you basically are running, you're basically dealing with one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life. I can't think of one person, and I'm not saying this as, as simply as a bump, but in 20 years, I can't think of anyone who had, uh, who had a personal criticism with the guy. He was someone that everyone always loved. And every band had, had its asshole, you know. I, I might have been that guy for a bit, who knows. Uh, I think our band kind of, kind of rotated the asshole, you know. But no, Tad, Tad wasn't that. Many people will cite Eight Way Santa as being, you know, the defining record. And in many ways it really was. It was very versatile, some fucking amazing, memorable songs on the record. Working with Butch Vig, you know, this is ahead of his recording, Nevermind. <laughs> So it's a great sounding record. The band's very confident. You know, there was a lot of uh, internal distress during the recording of that record. I know that that's, that record led to the ultimate, you know, fragmenting of the, of Tad Mach 1. Can't find a way to get back. We knew we had some really good songs and we'd really gotten our legs together and we knew how each other were playing. And this was Steve's last record. He uh, was, I think, not fully satisfied with the direction the band was going in, but I don't think he really knew what direction he wanted to go in himself. He was not uh, cooperative and didn't want to play at certain times of the day. And it actually came down to a point where we had to get we had to get some things done and I said, Okay, Steve, I'm gonna play drums then. Tad had a very uh set idea of how he wanted the drums to be. He really wanted Steve to just to lay down a solid foundation and that was it. And there was a bit of a disagreement over this. And um so Steve retired to the uh upstairs office and I think he drank maybe fourteen beers and he came down in one take, he played the, 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 the drum part perfectly, just the way Tad wanted. His drumming on the rest of the record is phenomenal, just perfect. Uh, but from that point onward, he felt like he, he was being told what to do, I, and no longer was it a spontaneous, natural thing, and there was a bit of resentment, and I think that was what contributed to his decision. Well, we had just got done um, recording it in Madison, and uh, <clears throat> I, I pretty much made my mind up at that point. I don't remember why. But when we got back, I did, you know, take the picture in the back of the album with the Puyallup Fair, and that was it. I'm done. Yeah, little vans and stuff. And I mean, I just missed home too much, I guess. If you're out on the road and you're away from home and you know you don't have the same bed every night, you know the comforts that most people enjoy, it can get to you. For that record, I mean, we, we're we've been playing together, and that's you know we're starting to get that you know that psychic thing that was happening, the unspoken musical. Feel. We're writing together as a unit. It was, it was really a good special time for the band. 
And it was uh, before a lot of the uh, craziness went on with the major label feeding frenzy in Seattle. And uh, it was good and it was innocent and it was honest and pure and uh, it was fun. wanted to go out and promote that record uh, right away, but we couldn't because we didn't have a drummer. <laughs> so we did touring with him for Eight Way Santa. Please welcome Tad. excitement. That's what it's all about. Well, you know what? I think we'll, we're going to head over to uh, Boise, Idaho. And... Beautiful. I'm enjoying one of my favorite pastimes, which is drinking in bed. Bottle here up here. just hit the road. We got to the venue and there was a phone call from our attorney and I, I just knew it was bad news. When you get a phone call from your attorney generally it's not good news and um, and sure enough uh, he said uh, look you know that photograph that's on the cover those people 
um, they, they saw it and uh, they're suing you. Over to a friend's house and uh, they, they had been to a thrift store and they had a photo album. They just bought the photo album so they could put photos in it, but they already had photos in them. We turned the page to this one shot and it was this woman and this man and the guy looked like he was in Nazareth. You know, he had the full-on big handlebar mustache and long hair. And they're just both cooked to the gills. They're both stoned. You could tell they had that kind of pied look to them. And, and the woman wasn't, she was wearing a bandana for a bra. And he was holding her and they were just grinning ear to ear. Took that photo and we showed it to Bruce. And much like that look he saw when I played him the single for the first time, he's like, Oh my God, this is awesome. And he says, can I take this? And he took it and he had somebody do some enhance, color enhancements. And... and to this day, uh, it's one of my favorite covers ever in the history of uh, Sub Pop. Little did we know, though we should have considered it at the time, this couple, though they had split up, they still were in the Seattle area. And they went into Tower Records. One of them went into Tower Records. Do you have this record? And the clerk was like, yeah, we got like 20 or 30 of them right over here. And this is not at a time of CDs. This is still vinyl, still quite prominent. So this is big picture. She's like freaking out. Oh my God, this is a part of my past I don't want to remember. And they go, what the fuck? You know, uh, except they didn't say what the fuck. I think it, they have become born again Christians. So they were saying like, what thy fuck? We had built up this head of steam and we finally got a story. It was just the wrong story because at that point in time, the bigger the record became, the more damages they could sue us for. So we're suddenly in a place where we're trying to, no, 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 it's really, it's a small record and uh, it's gonna stay a small record and. Oh, they thought, oh, we're gonna be millionaires after this or something like that. I, I have no idea what they thought. Typically, when records are released, they're gonna do most of their sales in the first four to six weeks. So to have your record pulled two weeks into it, um, that really, it, I think it, it hurt Tad's career a bit. And we had to re-engineer the artwork and get something back out, and it was, it was pretty challenging. This is a big deal record. This is a record where we were going to break Tad. Also at that time, we released a CD single, Jack... There was a particular employee who we let go, who I remember just being hateful. And I swear to God, though I cannot prove it to this day, that this particular employee made me aware that we had infringed on their logo for the Jack single, where we basically used the logo, only we put Tad in the middle of the logo ex-employee who was pissed off at the company, otherwise we probably would have gotten away with it, is their way of saying, shouldn't have fired me, bros. I was not too stoked thinking that uh, their name of their product uh, would be involved in uh, the possibility of drunk driving. And so we heard from police council, and they were like, you know, we're going to sue you for millions of dollars, you know, you're fucked get out of the business, go back to being a fry cook, get out of our lives, get out of our face, we're gonna kill you, crush you, etc. cetera. The, the label still hadn't sold Nirvana or anything, or maybe it was about to, but that's a lot of money to put out there. And I think it really, it really made it hard to get a second win to the record, even though the record was amazing. <laughs> Controversy sells if you have distribution. Unfortunately, what Tad suffered from was controversy without distribution. 
So suddenly you had all these people talking about this record that had pissed off. Um, but that record couldn't be found anywhere. And, you know, that was a very unfortunate incident, I think, over time. It was more just a nuisance in, in, in retrospect, you know, because here was this, like, punk rock band slash metal band, not out to, like, mess up anybody's life or anything. You know, we're just out doing what we do and having fun doing it. And all of a sudden we got all these weird chain of events happening. And it's, it was really bizarre. Kind of comic looking back at it, but at the time frustrating as hell. Parman loves me, this I know, <laughs> cause Bruce Pavitt told me so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are weak and they are strong. Yes, Parman loves me. Yes, Parman loves me. Yes, Parman loves me. You know why now? Because Bruce Pavitt told me so. By this time, there had been so much uh, frustration uh, and, and so much uh, rancor and, and bitter feeling uh, that was really nobody's fault. Um, but it had to find a target somewhere. And generally, bands rail against their labels. So in a tried and true tradition, we did the same. We would have been happy to stay with Sub Pop had they been had they appeared to be financially solvent. But it was getting to be like they were owing so much money to so many different people around town, to the bands. We just saw it as a way of like saving our friendships with Bruce and Jonathan, like, well, maybe we'll just like remove this sort of, you know, back away from the business side of things. It's tough to be in a place where you're dealing with friends and having to talk about money. You know, especially when you want the best for your friends and you're just not able to do any more than you're able to do at a certain time, you know. At the time, you know, I felt a little indignant, but even at the time, I kind of went, all right, you know, it's like we didn't have our stuff together. We wanted to see if we could do something different, you know, and there was interest out there. We had people knocking on our door, you know wanting to, to develop us. The first thing was uh, RCA BMG, you know, biggest record company in the world was interested. Partly what happened in our favor was like that Nirvana record was, was blowing up big and the Pearl Jam record was bubbling un under at that point and the people in the industry realized they had no fucking idea what was going on all of a sudden, you know, it was like up a few months previous to that, they could just sell Michael Jackson and Paula Abdul and CNC Music Factory. A lot of people were investing huge amounts of money into these bands, thinking this is, you know, the next musical revolution. We're starting to realize that although we're having fun, this could be a possibility of not having to work a day job ever again for a while. That was our dream, really. I mean, we didn't plan on making a lot of money or, or being rock stars. The idea was to, to play music for a living. You know, that's all I ever asked for. That's all I ever wanted. You know, we were really leery of major labels. You know, I'd grown up through punk rock and hardcore and, and you know, major labels were nothing but evil. They had it all like neatly packaged and defined and they knew what kind of thing was gonna sell to the kids and all of a sudden they didn't know anymore. So they let us, when we signed Warner Reprise, they let us do whatever the fuck we wanted. We recorded in the same house studio that we recorded the previous record with at Sub Pop. All the rest of that money we kept. You know, that's how come I have this house. There wasn't any pressure to, to come up with anything, you know, earth shattering or there was no delusions that we we're gonna sell billions of records. We always had the, the attitude that we wanted to play our music and if somebody wanted to help us achieve that goal with their money and financial backing and their press and their, their radio expertise, we're into it. Well, Rusty, you never heard Do anything. Do the same thing. Up with the bike. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's nice. Another one. Another one's good. Hold it. Ah. 
Josh, lift up the bike, cross it up. We had uh, Josh on drums, and so we were kind of a new band, we felt like a new incarnation. We had new blood, and Josh was a few years younger than the rest of us. In the beginning of 92, I had just gotten out of the, uh, the Accused. I did this little demo at Reciprocal um, with Jack, with just me playing the drums. And it's like a little five minute, or a little like 30 second clip. Then a few weeks later, I got a call from Kurt Danielson asking, you know, do you want to come try out for the band? You know, real snappy, could play lightning fast, and he played hard as hell. I've never played with a drummer that played as hard as he does. He was breaking shit regularly, and that was really fun. For this record, we wanted to do something different, um, and we'd been friends with Jay Mascus from Dinosaur Jr. ever since we'd uh, played with those guys at the Central in Seattle in 88. We had a major record deal and all this, you know, like a budget. We were there for, you know, two weeks. I went to the bank and, uh, and got a wire for 40 grand. Yeah, carrying around a roll of fat cash was, was a pleasure. <laughs> we spent it well on uh, nothing but rock and roll. Jay had a lot of good input. Most of the time, Jay just sat with his sunglasses in the back in the couch. And I swear to God, most of the time he was taking naps because he had the sunglasses on. You couldn't tell what his eyes were doing. and uh, my vocals were getting better. For a major label, nobody was breathing down our neck. Nobody came out to watch us, or or, or to, to to be a watchdog, or or to to make sure that we were weren't blowing the company money on cocaine or nothing like that. The last hours of the session. How do you feel there, bud? I don't think it's quite as bad as Gary portrays it to be. That's one of my favorite records too. I mean. Uh, that one was like really turning point. That was we started to go more into the the metal edge of that one. Our our chops were much better. We're out with uh, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. During that record, you know, we went out with really well known bands at the time, you know. And uh, we're we're holding our own. Yeah. Hi. Back up too much. The rave that follows us wherever we go. Yeah, boy. Oh, <laughs> 
I did it. I did it all. It's great to be able to fucking be up there and sound louder than fucking God, you know, for a few minutes. <laughs> The mayonnaise in the hair. Don't you? Oh, you're sick. <laughs> Come on, Ted, right now. Bring that camera, follow me. What are you doing? <laughs> Kurt, are you encouraging this kind of behavior? Yeah. Like, I think it's good, clean fun for kids today that you're with the garbage cans. Usually we check out our dressing room though, it's like, let's go over and see Tad. And just walking in, you know, somewhere in Canada or, or, or in Germany, and, and Tad and Josh and uh, Kurt just sitting there, just kind of that sort of well-imbibed, you know, <laughs> vacuous sort of stare and glare. There would have been a whole lot more fun if they were somehow responsive in some, <laughs> in some kind, I mean, I mean, Gary was a blast because he was alert, you know, he knew what was going on. The other guys are sort of like a wall of vacancy. But it was amusing because they'd all walk out there and they'd, you know, and just blow doors. I'm still on drugs for a living. Actually. During the lean times, uh, I sell a few stuffed badgers on the side and make ends meet. And you see the press killed it? <laughs> well, the badgers were killed, uh, strangled. But I'm talking about the Seattle thing. Oh, excuse me, misunderstood there. <laughs> You can hold on to my back and stuff if you want. Yeah, you can I just hold my shirt. We're contacts. I'm gonna be hurting tonight. And then uh, not that I need one to even suit. Where I go to the bottom and then when I shoot out of the top, you snap the picture. Yeah. But don't be too specific specific about the words because we're not sure what song. I can just go habba 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 habba. That's good. Best muscle. <laughs> Why were we dropped? It was never explained, never clarified. There's uh, this poster. Tad, it's heavy shit. It's been claimed that this is the reason the labels were under a lot of pressure to clean up their act and start putting warning labels on records, you know, questionable material. We had nothing to do with this poster. Uh, it, it was just uh, the brainchild of somebody who, who was working for the promotional company that promoted the tour. But we loved it. We thought it was a great idea and beautifully executed. That was a communication error between, from what I understand, between management and the label. 
perhaps uh, a butterfly uh, moved its wings in Patagonia and that influenced somebody at Giant and a decision was made and we were dropped. I, I don't know. Uh, could be anything. Um, the, the fact is, is that nobody ever explained it to us. They cut off tour support and we're stuck in Europe. They pulled the, the carpet out from under that one. We, we felt like a curse was kind of like following the band, like a, a dark cloud hovering over us all the time and uh, that we couldn't escape it. And no matter what we did, that it was cursed. And it, we're just starting to get the feeling like, what the hell is going on, you know? It's like, you know, we're starting to feel like jinxed. Yeah, he knows his shit though, doesn't he? We've been together for quite a while and there was just some tension in the band. I can't really explain it except for by saying that. Well, I think musically we're just kind of like Kurt and I were wanting to head in a different direction and I don't know if Gary really was suited to that. He probably was. I don't think that there was a strange division going on. It wasn't like Gary did anything that warranted being kicked out. It wasn't like uh, he quit in a, in a fury. And, and Gary was probably the most sane guy out of us at the time. There's a lot of not good drugs going on. And uh, I was, personally, I can speak for myself, I was not the healthiest of mind and body and spirit at the time. Kurt kind of lost, you know, uh, touch with being grounded, and so did I. I was right there with him on that. Gary would have beers and stuff, but he wasn't, he wasn't really, he wasn't into smoking pot and, and doing drugs and stuff. He was really, a, Gary is a good person. It's, it's a really important and strong role that Gary provided. And everyone knew that. Everyone in the other bands and in the music community knew that. Gary keeps those guys sane and he's the guy who, know, you know, who, who directs them and keeps them focused. Uh, I tend to sort of blame myself that maybe if I had worked harder, uh, could have smoothed things over and, and gotten things together. Um, and, and I really regret it. Uh, it's one of those things that you, you can't fix. You, you can't turn back the clock. I wish it hadn't have happened. I wish that, that somehow we could have kept Gary in the band and, and that he was p a part of that infrared writing hood recording. Infrared Running Hood was uh, the first record that we went as a three-piece. That record was where things kind of got... I'm surprised that some of us made it through that. People were getting whacked out of their minds. Oh, man. What's up, Ben? We're busted. <laughs> what? The Infrared Sessions were uh, quite interesting because their manager, Johnny Z, actually flew out from New York and spent some time with us in the studio. Josh wanted to add some industrial sounds to one of the songs. So uh, in those days, you know, I, I also managed Ministry, Al Jorgensen, and they just liked some of the effects that Ministry used, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of sampling it, they, they wanted to get real sound. So we were banging on stuff and keeping a beat. And I think they gave me a pipe to play. Really good drummer, psychopath from hell, man. He was a real psycho, but he's a great guy. See, because Tad was into that. He was like, I was like, what do you think if I get these pieces of metal and I smash them 
wasn't just like we were like banging on shit and oh that's great you know it was it had a method to it and there was a, a desired end effect that we were going for the way we wrote that record was a direct result of n not wanting to be overly analytic about the music it started off with the first song the way we wrote that record Kurt had that bass riff that went dan da dan da dan da dan da dan da dan da dan and I just started playing the drums and that whole record was written like that somebody just started playing a riff and we wrote and we not once we never went okay this goes four times how, okay how many times are we going to do this when are we going to change that nothing was said nobody does that you know, nobody makes a record and doesn't talk about how many times you're gonna do this part, we're gonna put this change, I've got this riff. Nobody said anything. There was, can you imagine what I'm saying? It's like, that's how together uh, we were at that point. And we just went in and did that record. And it really was that. And I thought that that record was so great because we did that. And that meant that how tight we were. It's kind of a pop aesthetic behind this record. Uh, a lot of the songs are, are very catchy, kind of a la Eight Way Santa. But there's also some 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 very heavy shit happening too. You know, the stuff that Tad was doing uh, near the end of their career was the best Tad stuff of all. Take me amazed I mean how the fuck do you go and make a record and get that gacked out of your mind and actually have anything come out and then you hear infrared and it's a brilliant record uh, basically the a and rep loved them and thought Ted was the next big thing and they hired Ted because uh, they signed Ted because of it the a and person got fired and all of her bands got dropped literally the week the record was going to the stores. They're trying to find who to talk to about us. And they, they called up and they, and they said, which band? You know, and that's kind of a bad sign at that point, you know. Well, we don't know who you should talk to about that, you know. And when an a &R person gets terminated at a major label, all of their bands get axed regardless of quality. Nobody's even listening to the music at that point. It's strictly a matter of bureaucratic musical chairs shifting. And the bands are often the unwitting victims of this, and it, it has nothing to do with music. Uh, chances are nobody even listened to the Tad record. We found out in retrospect that a whole whopping 650 bucks was spent on advertising for Infrared Riding Hood. The label just writes off the money. It's a loss. They deduct it from their taxes or whatever they do. So Infrared Riding Hood, as far as I can see, just became a tax loss for somebody. And uh, the record showing up in the Record of the Month Club, you know, buy 10 discs for five cents. It's the 11th. Our record's out. And you know what? There Shut up! One fucking bit of advertising out there for us. <clears throat> the record label said they were going to do it. They fucked up. Fuck up, number one. Strike one. Does anybody care? I don't think so. <laughs>
They basically just wanted the band to go away at a lecture. They really wanted Ted to go away. They were scared of Ted. They didn't know what to make of him. Somewhere there's a warehouse full of those records. I don't know where it is. That was pretty much the end of Tad's label career. They do this thing where it's like, well, you know, we won't give it to you so you could do something with it. We're just going to, it's like a little kid that, uh, you know, um, that you don't want to play Legos his way, so he's going to grab all of his Legos and go home and fuck you. When we got dropped from Giant, Josh bounced back like the rest of us did. But when we got dropped a second time, uh, you know, it was a little too much. And I think it was a little too much for all of us. Um, but I think he reacted the quickest. I think it's because, you know, I wasn't the healthiest person. So I just decided to just, to just walk away from it instead of deal with it. I'm a lot different person now than that. I deal with my problems, you know, instead of run from them. But back then, I, I did a lot of that. I would just run from problems. And I, I attribute that to, you know, substance abuse. We were on a constant roller coaster ride, emotionally, psychologically, physically. Why not destroy guitars? Why not light off explosives? Why not destroy television sets? Why not uh, do this? Why not do that? I mean, it seemed like we had nothing to lose. I mean, uh, when you've lost everything already, what else have you got to lose? Nothing. I was locked up in a room that I was renting in West Seattle, and I'd never go out. I can, I can say that uh, when it came to drug abuse, uh, I, I took it very seriously and uh, explored it very thoroughly. Backstage, every, every night you get a, a bottle of hard liquor and a case of beer. And uh, as you gain in popularity, you get to order what you want backstage. And, and so there's more and more booze all the time. And uh, eventually, uh, you, you need something to get over those hangovers with. And so, so something else always enters the picture. I liked Coke a lot. And I found that I couldn't afford it that much. So I went for the cheaper version of that, which was crystal meth and glass. I was taking cash advances on my credit card to go buy more, and I'd only leave at night. You know, I was becoming a, essentially a addicted vampire. I had a police scanner that I bought that I'd listen to because I was sure they were coming after me someday. That's how far it went, you know. It's, it's part of the side of the Seattle music scene that isn't talked about, that isn't so glamorous, isn't so glorious, doesn't look so good on camera. Um, and, you know, cost a lot of bands the chance of success and cost a number of people their lives. When you've been together for, for 10 or 12 years, uh, you, you begin to know each other on a level that is akin to uh, how a husband and wife know each other. You, know, you, you can second guess that person. You know their worst side, you know their best side, uh, and you might be a bit sick of that person too. He's a lifelong friend and that, that's never going to change. We've gone through a lot together and shared a lot of things together. Triumphs as well as defeats. So that, that brings you together, you know. We're a team. Hello? All right. What's up? Kurt, what are you doing? <laughs> Come on in, man. You son of a gun. You were kidding. This is a big surprise. <laughs> what are you doing, Howard? <laughs> Coming to visit you? <laughs> Look at you all dressed up. <laughs> People can be in bands and that all they have in common is this uh, musical vision, but you know, I, I think that's where we went a little step further. You know, we we love being around each other. You know. They're legends, absolutely, and they're part of a very vital scene. And I think they're just, in my mind always going to be seen as, as part of the most happening scene that uh, 
sales experience before since? What Tad accomplished was certainly head and shoulders above what 95% of rock bands accomplish. He wasn't selling records because of image, he was selling records because of content. Whether anybody makes it in this business is largely dependent on factors that have nothing to do with music. Nothing whatsoever to do with music, and a big chunk of it is luck. And um, random factors did not operate in their favor. So I think there still is a life to this music, um, but you know, Tad's story, unfortunately and sadly, is always going to be a story of uh, what could have been as opposed to what was, and that's going to be part of their legacy. The thing I'm most proud about the music is that we always stuck to what we believed in, and we weren't shifting what we we're doing to appease anybody or to look good. You know, we, we let it all hang out right from the beginning, you know. And, and just being full of integrity and, uh, and, and keeping the course and doing what we had no choice in doing because we wanted to do it and that's what we were. You know? At the time, it's right. I like to think that uh, you know, the, the music's gonna live on and that hopefully it won't come to a point where we have to die for people to figure that out. <laughs>